how to love you more. I can't think of a more appropriate example of how to love more than the life of Jesus. Amen. We're going to be looking at Jesus. We're going to be looking at his interaction with a place and a structure and what it means for us today as we do the same. We're going to get to John chapter 2. That's where Jesus enters the temple, but I think we need to get a little bit of a setup from Jesus' Bible, which is our Old Testament. God always wanted to be with His people. In the beginning, that's the way it was. In the beginning, God created everything. And He made humans in His image. And when you look in the garden, they're dwelling in the same space is God and His creation. And it was good. It was very good is what God said about it. But something drove a distance between God's created image bearers and God. The simple answer is sin. It's a little bit more complicated than that. The humans decided that they knew what was best and they wanted to do what they wanted instead of what God had called them to do. And this drives a distance between God and the people. But God always wanted to dwell with His people. So you fast forward, many things happen, and God keeps reaching out and interacting with His people and appearing to His people and talking to His people. Eventually, they wind up in Egypt. God provides for them through that, but then, well, power being what it is, the ruler of Egypt starts oppressing God's people. And he hears them. He knows what they're going through. And so he hears their cries and he comes down and he rescues them out of that. And we get in the book of Exodus, God leads them out of Egypt, does mighty signs and wonderful things, gets them to a mountain called Sinai. And there we have this interesting story of God wanting to meet with the people. God is on Sinai and He he tells Moses, prepare the people, consecrate them, get them ready to be in my presence. And so they do, they prepare this. They hear a loud ram's horn sound and God descends on the mountain and it frightens the people. God's language in this is like, don't let the people rush the mountain. Well, the people don't want to rush the mountain, they're staying way back at a distance. They're terrified. So much so that they get to hear the voice of God and they don't want to hear it. They tell Moses, we'll listen to you, but you, know, you talk to him. We don't want to do that. So, so where God had this idea of on the mountain and him being able to speak to the people, and they don't want to come any closer, God does something. God comes down from the mountain. A whole lot of the second half of Exodus is the people building the dwelling place for God so that God can come down off of His mountain and be with His people. It's how the story ends. Exodus ends with that high point. The people won't go up to God, so God will come down to His people. It's a beautiful story. God stays with His people. They make all kinds of mistakes. They don't trust Him. They think He's out to harm them. They they have faith struggles. It's a mess. But God stays with them. He wants to be with His people. Eventually, they enter into the promised land. They, They finally trust Him and do what He says, and it works out the way He says. We get a story of a king named David, a great king. And David has on his heart to build a permanent dwelling place where God can dwell with his people. And God turns that wish on David. David says, I want to build a house for you, God. And God says, "Mm, I'm going to build a house through your line. You see, you want a physical place for me to dwell with my people. I'm thinking maybe about coming through a person. It's a strange story. But let's think about it for a moment. If God made us 
in His image, and God wants to be with His image, just about the only way to do that is to be like His image and be with them. The idea of God becoming human is not inconceivable. That's later in the story. But the next thing that happens, major thing that happens in the story is that God will allow David's son to build that dwelling place. The temple is constructed. It's a magnificent structure. And as they get ready to start using it, Solomon prays this heartfelt prayer. It's in 2 Chronicles chapter 6. And when he's praying to God, he wrestles with the question, can God really dwell with his people? I mean, God, you've seen us. We're a mess. Can you really live with us? And he rationalizes that God is so big, the universe can't even contain him, but part of him can dwell with his people. And so the first thing that he prays for is for God to make this temple a place of justice. That what God says is right will happen here. And that it would be a sign of justice. That anybody who thinks about doing something that God doesn't want them to do, when they see this place, they will be convicted and remember that we serve a just God and they will be just. The whole structure, not just a place for God to be, but a testimony to everybody around them of God's character. Then he realizes, but we're messed up. (laughs) So God, when we mess up, Listen to our hearts, because our hearts are going to be set on you. And even when we do the wrong thing out here, God, please forgive us from your temple. And be with us, because without you, we can't make it. But that's a small thing to ask God, because Solomon has bigger plans for this building. And so let's read part of his prayer. This is in 2 Chronicles chapter 6, and verse 32. As for the foreigner who does not belong to your people Israel, but has come from a distant land because of your great name and your mighty hand and your outstretched arm, when they come and pray toward this temple, then hear from heaven your dwelling place. Do whatever the foreigner asks of you, so that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you, as do your own people Israel, and may know That this house I have built bears your name. So Solomon wants the temple not just to be a house of God, but to be a testimony not just to Israel, but to everyone of the goodness of God. That if God is in that place and people pray to that God, God will hear them and God will answer them. The whole structure is not just a house. The whole structure is a testimony to the goodness and the compassion of a God who loves everyone. He's not just concerned with some. He wants them all. That's Solomon's dream for this temple. The problem is that people forgot the dream. It's a beautiful prayer. But the people didn't seem to care. Because you see, after a while, they started saying, well, you know, I'm better than you, so I deserve to be here and you don't. This testimony to God's goodness starts becoming exclusatory. And by the way, you know, if this serves our God, well, why can't it serve other gods? And so this house that's supposed to be a testimony to the true God becomes filled with all these other gods. God finally has enough. His presence departs, and the armies come in and level it, and haul the people off to captivity. Now, if you read Ezra and Nehemiah, you'll know that God, after a time, keeps His promise to send the people back to the land, and they come back, and they try to build a temple again, and they start laying the foundation, and it's just not the same. You see, when the tabernacle was there and God came on it, amazing praise. God's presence is clearly there, fire, cloud, whole thing. Solomon's temple, same thing. Ezra and Nehemiah's temple, 
and they lay the foundation, and some people rejoice and others cry. Because they know God's, God's not here. We're here, but where is God? And they start wrestling with this question throughout time. Where is God? About a hundred years after the people come back and build that second temple, God sends a messenger. His name is Messenger. Malachi. And Malachi is pretty much the last writing you have from your Old Testament. It's the last book in your Old Testament. And what Malachi does is he comes to this temple. And he sees everything that's going on. And God gives him a message. And it's an important message. It's Malachi chapter 3. And it starts with the question, where is this God of justice that we think ought to be here? And so God responds to them. Chapter 3, verse 1. I will send my messenger who will prepare the way for me. Now, if you've spent much time in John's gospel, you've heard this. Isaiah talks about this. That when God returns to his people, when God comes back to his temple, he will send a messenger to prepare the way. When John the Baptist is out in the wilderness and he's baptizing people, people think, oh, you're, are you the Messiah? And he goes, nope. I'm the guy preparing the way. Isaiah, Malachi, God will send the messenger to prepare the way, and then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant that you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. But who can endure the day of coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire and a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites. I mean, these are the guys that are supposed to be the priests. They're supposed to be the mouthpiece of God. They're supposed to be imaging God like nobody else. But they're not. If you read before this in Malachi, you'll realize they're not doing anything that God asked them to do. So the messenger will come, the Lord will come to his temple, and will start refining the system. Look down at verse 4. The offerings in Judah, once this happens, the offerings in Judah and Jerusalem will be acceptable to the Lord as in the days gone by. In other words, this will restore proper worship and proper praise to God. Verse 5, so I will come to put you on trial. I will be quick to testify against all this bad stuff and all these people, amongst whom are those who defraud laborers of wages, who oppress the widows, the orphans, and the foreigners among you from justice. But do not fear me, says the Lord. So Malachi makes a promise. A messenger is going to prepare the way. Then the Lord's going to come to his temple and he's going to hold court. And he's going to put an end to anything that doesn't work. Are you following me? John's gospel starts by talking about this word of God, who's human, and God. And the next thing we get is a guy who says, I'm the messenger. I'm preparing a way for the Lord. And he points out Jesus and he goes, that's the guy. And then now, we see John's account of the Lord returning to his temple. This is John chapter 2, starting in verse 13. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. Pause on that for just a minute. We've done this mental exercise before, but let's just imagine that we are in ancient times and Jerusalem is somewhere in the neighborhood of Branson, okay? You need to get there, but you're not one of the fortunate ones that drives a brand new Mercedes Camel. So how are you going to get there? God gave you these feet for a reason. So you're going to walk there, you know, that nice smooth path between here and Branson, 
There's no roads. You, you just got to get there. Oh, and by the way, you also need to bring um, a, a offering. And so, you know, you're going to bring one of your, your sheep or your, you know, your goats or something like that. But you've got to get them from here to there through all the woods and all the stuff. Oh, and by the way, they can't have a scratch on them when they get to the temple. That's dedicated worship, folks, for people who make that journey. They care about the Lord. At some point, somebody got wise and said, you know, that's just too hard to do. Let's make it easy. They're, they're, they're going to get all scratched up on the way there, and then they won't be able to offer these animals. So let's provide acceptable animals in and around the temple. Great idea. Let's do it. And then pretty soon that went from just being in and around the temple to actually in the temple. Let's think about the temple for a minute. Because Solomon's temple was supposed to be inclusive of everybody. I want everybody to come here and pray to God and learn about it. By the time the second temple is built, eh, we're not sure how close we want you to get to God. (laughs) So we're going to put walls up. Right? How would you like it if you came to worship today, but we said, no, you've got to stand out there by the kitchen. Welcome. Oh, and if you cross the foyer, we're going to kill you. Welcome to church this morning. That's what's going on in the temple. The foreigners that Solomon was so concerned about that would see God and come close to God, no, we're going to keep you guys way out there, kind of near the parking lot. So when it comes time to put animals near the temple for people to be able to purchase them, where do we put them? Ah, we'll put them there where those foreigners are. Okay. Well, these people are traveling from all over and from different nations and what, you know, what are we going to do with money? Because, you know, God said we shouldn't have any graven images. And, you know, if you look at a coin in your pocket, it's got a graven image on it, doesn't it? And it's usually some king or ruler or important person. And in the ancient world, they always claimed to be God. So now I have idols in my pocket. Surely I can't use that at the temple. Ah, don't worry, we'll take, we'll create a money system for the temple. And of course, you know, that's, it's going to cost some money to exchange your money. So, you know, we'll profit on that. Well, where do we put that commerce? Ah, just put it out there where those foreigners are. Does it sound like the temple has lost its way? Sound anything like Malachi was dealing with in his day? Yeah, 400 years may have passed, but not a whole lot has changed. So Jesus comes in. God returning to his temple, he comes in. And what should be an area of worship for all nations has become Walmart on Black Friday. With a lot more manure in the aisles. Let's be honest. Animals are messy. Is this what God intends in his worship? We'll pick up down in verse 15. So Jesus made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. Effectively, Jesus shuts down worship at the temple and then he makes this statement. Get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. But they replied, it's taken 46 years to build this place. And you're going to raise it in three days? But you see, the temple that he had spoken of was his body. And after he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. And they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. There's something interesting that happens here. You see, this worship that everybody thought was acceptable to God, and it was lying in a lot of pockets, to be perfectly honest. When God returns to his temple, when Jesus comes to the temple, he looks at it and goes, "Uh uh-uh, this isn't it. And he stops everything there. And then he talks about a temple. 
But notice what he's not talking about. He's not talking about the building that was under construction. It was always under construction. They were always building on it right up until the time that Rome leveled the thing. Jesus isn't talking about that building. Do you understand? When he talks about the temple, he's not talking about a place. He's talking about him. The place where God dwells with his people is not brick and stone. After all, God did not make stone in his image, did he? Who did he make in his image? Humans. And God becomes human and dwells with his people. The temple was supposed to be this testimony of God's faithfulness and goodness. The building's not doing that. What's doing that? The true temple. Jesus. You see, not only is Jesus being the perfect human being that God has called human beings to be, but he's also filling in for the temple that's lost its way. This wonderful building that everybody brags about and goes, oh, look how beautiful it is. It's worthless because it's not built upon the Lord. You remember our psalm reading this morning. If it's not built upon the Lord, it's worthless. And Jesus comes in and looks at the structure and he goes, it's in doing it. He is the only one that does it. And if we're going to be right with the Lord, if we're going to seek God, if we're going to see a testimony of what all is good and right and just in the world, if we are going to worship, it's not a building, it's Jesus. In doing this, he is putting himself in the place of that temple. And the things that happen in that building and the injustice and the greed and the segregation... That doesn't testify about who God is. Jesus does. Watch what happens after this. Jesus does this big sign, but he doesn't leave town immediately. He stays there. Verse 23. Now, while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs that he was performing, and they believed in or believed into his name. But Jesus would not... Entrust himself. That's an interesting phrase. It's the exact same word as believe. That the people believed in Jesus, but Jesus really didn't believe in those people. Hmm. Because he knew all people. Verse 25, he didn't need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. Ouch. Did that step on anybody's toes but mine? The fact that people would believe into Jesus, but Jesus wouldn't let himself believe into them at that moment. He knows what they're up to. He knows that these same people who just love him at that moment are going to be falling away as he asks them to follow him. That is... He's on his good days and, you know, handing out buffets full of food. Hey, they're there. But when he starts talking about how, you know, you're going to have to give yourself up and follow me, they're gone. And they're really comfortable with being at the temple. But when the temple is nailed to the cross, very few are to be found. The cross wasn't the end of it, was it? Because just as Jesus had said, if you destroy this temple, I'm going to build it in three days. Guess what happened three days later? There he is. We can get distracted by a lot of things. We can set our hopes and our goals and our dreams and our faith on a lot of things. Did we sing a song that you loved this morning? We sang one I loved. But at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter because we're not worshiping you or me. We're worshiping God, right? It's cooler down here in the seats. It's hotter up here on the stage. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter because it's not about my comfort. It's about us being here for God. This building is beautiful. If for some reason it got painted a horrid color tomorrow, could you still worship God? Because it's not about the building. 
It's about Jesus. We can make all kinds of plans with everything that God has given us. We can make all kinds of ministry goals. We can build whatever we want to build on this hillside. But if it's not built on Christ, it's worthless. The people had lost their way and they thought it was all about the space. It was all about the do's and the don'ts. It's all about our comfort. It's all about our convenience. It's all about, and Jesus comes and throws it all out the window and says, it's about me. And he knows people. We don't like that very much. I want you to realize that Jesus knows people. This happens in chapter 2. He knows people. He knows what they're going to do. Yet he still went to the cross. Jesus knows people. He knows that we're a mess. He knows that we fall short. He knows that we give up on him. He knows that we go after what we want instead of going after him. And he died for us anyway. The amazing story of John's gospel is that God came to his people. And he didn't give up on his people. And the beautiful part of it is is that later in John's gospel, Jesus is going to do this really deep teaching. And he's going to say, I've got to leave. And his disciples are going, you can't leave us. No, 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 it's better for me in this earthly body to leave so that I can come back to you again. In the form of my spirit. And my spirit will be with you. Folks, if you are here this morning, you are a walking temple of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you follow him, you are. And wherever you go, a part of him goes. Whatever you do, a part of him does. So stop for just a minute and think about what you're doing. Because are you taking your temple and making it be anything besides what it is that testifies about Jesus? Because what happens to temples that don't represent God well? They're destroyed. If you're here this morning and you're struggling in your walk with Jesus, Jesus knows you and he went to the cross anyway. You were worth that. And there's nobody that's fallen too far for his love, his justice, his mercy, and his forgiveness to reach. And if you're thinking, boy, I don't image him very well, he knows you. And he chose to work through you in spite of your flaws. And he's placed his spirit within you to guide you, to help you be that image to other people. Buildings are wonderful, but I tell you, this building doesn't go out in the community every week. You do. And you become a witness for all the foreigners that might look toward God and want to worship Him. Give them something that represents Jesus wherever you go. We're going to sing an invitation song. It's called In Christ Alone. There's so many things we put our hope in. There are so many things that we build and we construct and we think this is the answer. No, Christ alone is the answer. And if you haven't committed yourself to following him, I don't care what messed up stuff you've done. He died for you anyway. And he is willing to come to you and to dwell with you and to dwell together in this body that makes up the temple of the living God. Whatever you're struggling with, he knows you. He hears you, and He loves you, and He wants you to love Him. Will you do that this morning? We're going to sing this song, and if there's anything you need to do to get yourself in a right relationship with Christ, come find me, and let's talk about it while we stand and while we sing. Hi.
Father, our prayer is that we will stand in the power of Christ and on nothing else. Father, this world puts so much hope in so many things that just don't matter. You are all that matters. Father, may we represent you well as we carry your light from this place, as we go into the community and we bear your image to others. Father, may it be a true image. May our temple not be tarnished by the trappings of this world. May we stand in Christ and Christ alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Go with God. We'll see you next time.